Uh, Debbie and I will be handing off as we go through this presentation, but we'll also be interrupting each other as we go along. Uh, so I'm starting it, and then I'll, I'll hand it off to Debbie. And as I get started, one thing I'd like to do is talk a bit about why we're dealing with this topic. Why is planning for outsourcing so important? Uh, I'm looking at, at a report that I pulled from the web this week that is a 2008 outsourcing report from Deloitte Consulting. And I want to just read a paragraph for you from that report which highlights why this is so important. They point out that the RFP is the starting point for selection. They say, the selection process begins with the creation of an RFP that incorporates the company's strategic requirements and should be based on the outsourcing business case. There is significant room for improvement in this area, and this is based on their interviews with 300 executives who are doing outsourcing. Uh, they point out that roughly half the vendor executives interviewed say that the RFPs they receive tend to be poor guidelines for what the companies who are doing acquisition really want. Many vendor executives felt that clients often lack a clearly defined outsourcing strategy, which is essential to developing a solid RFP. So in their, in their report, Deloitte looks at the lessons learned that these executives, acquirer executives, are citing. What would they do differently if they had to redo their outsourcing initiative? 49% of them say they would define more realistic service levels that align with business goals. 39% say they would define and align the business goals with their outsourcing strategy. 37% say they would develop, plan, and staff for service and contract management better. And 35% say they would spend more time on vendor selection and evaluation. So what we're finding is that they are concerned about doing things well at the start. So our focus today is what do you need to do at the start of the acquisition life cycle? <clears throat> so that you get the right things into your plan and into your contracts. So what we're dealing with here is a segment of the life cycle for an acquisition project that has input based on what the business is trying to do, the strategies, the user requirements for whatever is being outsourced, the constraints that apply, <coughs> the overall business case that applies. What we'd like to get as output from this phase of the life cycle is a good approach, an agreed on approach that matches our business strategies, gives us a full acquisition plan for the life cycle of what we're doing. So our goal in this session is to talk with you about the steps between the input and the output. Uh, how do you look at the alternatives for sourcing? How do you perform trade-off analyses that get you not only the appropriate selection, but the ways to go about it, the types of contracts, the types of provisions that you need to worry about. Then how do you document that approach, draft a plan, and then follow that plan as you go through the rest of the life cycle of acquisition? We'll first talk a bit about the context in which outsourcing is being done these days, then deal with some of the strategies and how you relate those to your outsourcing approach, how you do trade-offs, then talk about how to identify risks and how to manage risks throughout an outsourcing life cycle. And then finally, what things go into your plan and, wh and what do we mean by an acquisition plan? As we get started, we, we want to make sure that everybody is using the same terms or understanding the terms that we're dealing with. Um, this piece of our industry has more differences in terminology than it has commonality. Uh, some of the ISO standards are, are helping us get to common words for things like acquirer and supplier, uh, but still there are, there are a lot of different terms used in, in different organizations. <clears throat> so when we talk about sourcing and making sourcing selection um, choices here, we're talking about deciding whether we do things internally or whether we go externally for help from, from an outsourcer. Um, so the, the sourcing choices are a matter of deciding who will provide a product or a service or whatever kind of result we're trying to deal with. People sometimes talk about this as the make-buy decision. So do we deal with it internally? Do we make it? Do we buy it? A 
acquirer is the term we're using for the organization that is getting the product or service, that is acquiring it, the buyer, the customer, the client to the vendor, and so on. Uh, outsourcing, getting it externally, and supplier, that entity which provides the service or product externally to the organization that's, that's acquiring it. So it's the other side of the acquisition. So as I was saying, sourcing is deciding where it should be done, internally, externally, and how you go about it. So your alternatives include things like building it yourself internally or providing the service internally, <clears throat> perhaps adapting something you already have. So if you have the skills and abilities, that's generally the approach you'll take. These days, you also have a lot of alternatives available from the web, from new web services, from software as a service, from ASPs, that you can collect together into a solution and not have to pay somebody to build a solution for you. So if you can make a solution with an appropriate collection or a mashup, of the options that are out there, uh, quite often that's a very effective and economical sourcing alternative. In some cases, you can buy an off-the-shelf product, a COTS product, you know, or you can buy one and have it configured by somebody who understands that product. For the last decade or so, that's been a very common way to handle the large enterprise solutions, the ERP solutions for organizations. And then finally, there are several that you can several ways you can have a supplier build a custom solution. Establish your requirements, get it built either incrementally or all at once. Um, and something else you might find useful is to outsource a full business process, the thing that's called BPO or business process outsourcing these days. So there are many alternatives to think about. And among those alternatives, you have internal ones and external ones. So when we look at the world of, of IT, we often think about why do people outsource and how well is that working. Certainly people are outsourcing in areas other than IT these days, manufacturing of children's toys, for example, that we all hear about. But I think we get an, an awful lot of good data about what's going on in the world of IT, some of it which transforms and translates to other areas. Uh, we're citing here some data from a 2007 survey done by CIO Insight where they were asking yet again, uh, after doing it for several years, why are people outsourcing? And as they outsource, where are the challenges, where are the benefits? So talking to about 400 organizations here, evenly split among small, medium, and large businesses, um, they were asking, why are you doing this? What, what's the, the driver for you, if you will? And among the reasons, we see things like freeing up our people to do other things. So thinking about, for an organization, what are the core competencies we have that we care to put our resources in? And where we don't care to do that, we'd like to outsource it to someone else who can handle it. The second reason, reducing costs. The third reason, adding capacity, doing work that we can't get done in-house. Um, so going externally for supplemental resources, perhaps. And then finally, being able to increase the, the speed or the flexibility or the, the innovation of the organization. So those are respectable, helpful, interesting reasons to go after outsourcing. Um, and they probably do tie very well to the business reasons, the business strategies of the organization. Trends that, that CIO Insight was seeing when they looked at it over prior years was that outsourcing was rising, that is, more and more organizations were outsourcing, 